government has been toppled by the BJP and a Shiv Sena faction in Maharashtra on the back of a big win in Uttar Pradesh last year. A presidential election that suggests an opposition in disarray and the BJP with a clear strategy to go ahead. BJP on a roll and opposition split wide open. Which is why the political buzz in the national capital is this now. Is the general election of 2024 already a done deal? Or are we going ahead of ourselves? That's the focus of the political roundtable this week. Joining me on the roundtable, special guest in the studio is Rahul Srivastava, our national affairs editor. Yogendra Yadav, President Swaraj India, once leading cephologist as well. Nalin Kohli, BJP's stellar spokesperson. Kumar Ketkar, Congress MP and uh, former journalist. Sandeep Shastri, Vice Chancellor of Jagran University and National Coordinator of the Lok Niti Network. Appreciate all of you joining us. We'll also be joined a little later by Derek O'Brien of the TMC. But I want to start with you, Yogendra Yadav, and I want you to wear both your political and cephologist hat. Am I prejudging the entire elections of 2024 when I put my first big question? Is 2024 a done deal already, Professor Yadav? Uh, this is exactly the question BJP would like everyone to ask and begin to answer. It's in a psychological warfare, getting people to ask this question is very important and that's BJP's advantage. But if you look at it realistically, does the BJP enjoy psychological advantage today? Yes. In the last one month or so, has the BJP scored tactical political gains? Yes. Does it enjoy an advantage in the electoral battle which will be fought by people, where people vote, not MLAs and MPs, uh, perhaps no. Is it a done deal? Not at all, Rajdeep. Look at the economy, look at national security. The BJP faces a real uphill task for a government in its second term, which has had such tough situation, uh, largely of its own making in the question on, on the front of economy, a very difficult situation on the national security front. And we still have almost two years to go where both of these are likely to get worse than they are. Uh, it would really be uphill task for BJP to do it, uh, provided the opposition does not give in to this psychological warfare, because the name of the game is to get the opposition to concede defeat before the match begins. I sincerely hope the opposition doesn't do so for the sake of this country. Interesting that you're saying it's psychological warfare to suggest even that 2024 is a done deal. But Kumar Ketkar, the fact is state after state, the BJP we saw even at the start of the year win a big victory in Uttar Pradesh, win Uttarakhand, win Goa. Uh, and it appeared that the BJP therefore is, is virtually electorally at least at the moment looking invincible. Maharashtra, the second largest state, has also fallen your home state. Is the opposition really, therefore, like it or not, today is feeling more and more demoralized? Well, actually, 2024 is 21 months away. And Rajdeep, you are a cricket commentator as well as cricket player. And you know, almost till the last over, neither the cricket results nor elections can be actually predicted. How many times the cephalogists, the press pundits and the hopefuls in the commentator lobby have been proved wrong? I think the recent, recent reference was Mamata where everybody had concluded almost that Amit Shah will win, Amit Shah's strategy will win. Mamata won by landslide. But forget that, in 1977, late George Fernandes had declared that we should not contest at all because Indira Gandhi is going to win. But finally, he was overwhelmed by the public mood and the people actually elected Janata Party by a landslide. And nobody had predicted that in 1977. Similarly, on 1980, again, when Indira Gandhi came back, not a single press, you can refer to you, you were a journalist, at that time, not a single press commentator or the pandit or cephalogist had predicted Indira Gandhi with a landslide victory just three years after Janta victory. So I think such things, I think, are completely wrong. So you're wrong not demoralized? 
that anything you're not is demoralized the opposition and, uh, is not demoralized giving, uh, by giving, what's uh, giving a foreign example in night just one one small point one small point in us in us when truman was supposed to be losing the election in 1944 he actually won and mm -hmm. in 1992 nobody thought bill clinton will win when george bush had seen the collapse of the cold war and collapse of soviet union so i think elections are quite quite unpredictable most of the time and projections and extrapolations based on today's conditions okay i think can be dangerously wrong and people have experienced this press has experienced this psychologists have experienced this so i think i will not call 2024 a done deal just because opposition is in disarray opposition disarray does not actually determine the victory or defeat of the ruling establishment ruling party ruling alliance very interesting and we'll come to specifics a little later but nalin kohli in your opening remarks is this psychological warfare the manner in which the bjp has toppled the government uh, in maharashtra is this now being seen as part of this attempt to send out a message that we are creating an opposition mukt bharat slowly but steadily first rajdeep i don't uh, buy this argument that the bjp is sitting and working on some psychological warfare this is a topic of your choice some people would say you're not even fond of the bjp and you're entitled not to be if you wish to be so and the point is that who are we to decide what you'd like to create? the fact of the matter is let's approach it principally what uh, ketkar ji says is correct you don't write off an election till the election is over the last vote is counted and that's correct as a principle but then the ground realities and the track record of the BJP's performance as being poised to win 2024 would be evident repeatedly. The same what Yogendra Ji says, and I must say that I've always respected Yogendra Ji as a psychologist. We've been on shows together. But once you come into politics, then that psychology loses its objectivity. So whatever Yogendra Ji has said now, rejecting for the future, is the same script I've heard for the UP elections, I've heard it for the 19 elections, and I heard it before the 19 elections. So there is a script that the opposition hopes. That is a script based on hope that the Modi wave will die out because of many factors. But the Modi wave is based on a delivery model that focuses in delivering things to people. And that's what even the Uttar Pradesh result is. There is a class of beneficiaries now who have seen the benefit reach them of a governance model that has eliminated intermediaries and therefore also eliminated corruption. Now, if let me give an example of, say, the Pradhan Mantri, Garib Kalyan, 80 crore people targeted for food grains. People say there was theft in it, etc. But a large part went there. Ultimately, not a starvation death. It's a huge achievement in COVID. And the economy is not in a mess, as Yogendra Ji would say, because of the self-making of the Modi government, but rather in just so that we don't forget, we are in a post-COVID world where COVID has not wiped out. We are seeing what's happening with the external factors, yet the Indian currency is doing better than other currencies. Inflation is more under control than other economies. And broadly, the fundamentals are being recognized as being far better than several other hundreds, uh, over 100 or plus countries, maybe 150. So I think there are two arguments to close this. One is the opposition's arguments of fighting it on hope and aspiration and so be it. And the other is fighting an election on the ground. The BJP is focusing on the elections on the ground. The others are interested in fighting it in their heads. So okay. be it. We welcome that fight. Okay. So your opening remarks, Professor Shastri, uh, do you believe that we are being premature in a country particularly like India, where a week can be a long time in politics, to even suggest today that because of all that's happened in the last month, or over the last six months, 2024 appears a done deal for the BJP? Uh, Rajdeep, a lot of deals appear done, but a lot of deals could also be undone over time. We still have 20 months to go, Rajdeep, for the national election to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I would concede the point that the BJP looks clearly two steps ahead of the opposition. The BJP clearly is having an advantage. But would it be able to retain this advantage over a 20-month period, especially when it is completing two terms? I think will be an interesting question to watch. 
Rajdeep, let's remember that in January, February 2019, we were talking of uh, anti-incumbency against the BJP government. Balakot happens and then everything changes subsequent to that. So I think while the BJP seems to be at an advantage at the present point of time, and the oppo opposition does not seem to be getting its act together, uh, I would pause for a moment and not rush to say it's a done deal, but would say that the BJP clearly has an advantage, but a lot could happen in the next 20 months. Okay, Rahul Srivastav, our first round ends with you. 2024, done deal or not? Or are we again, as I keep saying, getting ahead of ourselves? You see, I think, Rajdeep, we are not getting ahead of ourselves. It's a fair thing to talk. But I think prejudging the mind of the voters in India is worse than prejudging the mind of the judges. Uh, that will be fatal. I think two years is a long time in Indian politics. Uh, you see the uh, rise and fall of parties and governments. Strong governments have come down largely because or with led by strong leaders have come down because of the mistakes made by the leaders and those governments. Mm -hmm. Indira Gandhi emergency, uh, Rajiv Gandhi made a lot of mistakes. Uh, then you had UPA, was not a very, it was a coalition government, but it was there for 10 years, but they made so many mistakes after 2009 that it was difficult. Then there was a rallying point. You had a Jay Prakash Narayan, you had a VP saying Atal Bihari, and there were those rallying forces. Uh, Today, the BJP has a very strong narrative. There are counter narratives in states. Uh, Mamta Banerjee, a successful political narrative against the BJP. TRS in uh, Telangana, YSRCP in uh, Andhra. But how do these narratives come together to form at one compelling narrative against the BJP has a flaw. The flaw is that it needs a pivot. And the Congress is the only party which has a, is in a pan-national character to become that pivot. But the Congress is on the decline, so much so underlined by this election to the president and the vice president, which is going to be there, that the party failed to get its own choice as a principal opposition party to as the candidates. It had a Congress person pushed by Sharad Pawar. It had a BJP person pushed by Mamta Banerjee. I think there are too many disparate narratives which need to come together and somebody needs to be heard. If so, that so two happen, issues. One is that the BJP needs to make a big mistake. Yes. In a sense to be pushed back. And number two, you need a pivot to bring the opposition together. Which brings me to our second question. Korn Banega Challenger. We often ask the question, Korn Banega Pradhan Mantri. Should we be asking the question, Korn Banega Challenger? Along with that, pegged to what Rahul said, is Congress the weak link in opposition? But let's turn to the first one. Korn Banega Challenger. I'm joined by Derek O'Brien, the Trinamool Congress's leader in the Rajya Sabha. And Derek O'Brien, the fact is that as Rahul Srivastava again pointed out, both for the president and vice president election, the impression we got is of the opposition in disarray. Vice president election, Trinamool Congress has decided to abstain. You won't even support Margaret Alva, chosen by the likes of Sharad Pawar, backed by the Congress. And this suggests that the real battle is to occupy the opposition leadership space. Mamta, Kejriwal, Pawar, Sonia Rahul Gandhi, all of you are at odds with each other. You mentioned some names along with the Chief Minister of Bengal and the Chairperson of the Trinamool Congress. So let me first address the names which you mentioned with all due respect to the other names you mentioned. Uh, Mr. Pawar. Mr. Pawar and the NCP are not part of any government in India. They were in a coalition government. You mentioned Mr. Kejriwal, you mentioned Sonia Gandhi. Let me tell you, Ms. Mamta Banerjee is a seven-time MP. She's a three-time chief minister. And in May 2021, I'm just putting out the facts. The Congress and the CPM in an alliance in Bengal and BJP support on the ground, Mamta Banerjee won almost a two-third, three-fourth majority. This is not the time to look at that. The bigger issue here is the BJP have to be defeated in 2024. The vice, and there are two kinds of opposition parties, 
like-minded parties, since everyone is using the term like-minded parties. Yes, we're all like-minded parties who will do all it takes to remove this bigoted, divisive BJP party who are ruining the institutions of this country, who do not manage to give jobs to young people, who do not manage to uh, prevent the dollar from hitting 80 Mr. rupees. Mr. O'Brien, I'm issues. sorry to intervene. You're giving the rhetoric. Kinds. You didn't answer Mr. my Mr. question. Sardis, I just you have not even me stood me by seconds. the uh, opposition when it comes I'm, to the I vice know. president election. I am, I the am, perception is of disarray. Not, the if perception you, if you is of disarray me, Mr. and Sardis, of one-upmanship. You yourself Mr. said Mamta Banerjee is a seven-time MP, three-time chief minister. Sharad Pawar doesn't have a certain state. Kejriwal has two states, by the way, now. Punjab and Delhi. Some would say city-state. But the fact is... You're not answering my question of the opposition being in disarray. No, no, no. Mr. Sardesai, Mr. Sardesai, I am, I am answering your question. I am answering your question. There are two kinds of parties in the opposition. Like-minded parties. Yes, we are all like-minded parties who need to remove the BJP. You're telling me I'm giving you rhetoric. Employment is rhetoric. 80 rupees to the dollar is rhetoric. No, it's not rhetoric. It's the reality. And opposition will raise this. Now, there are two kinds of like-minded parties. Like-minded, yes, we're all like-minded. But there's a difference. On one side, you have parties like the NCP, like the Shiv Sena, like the RJD, like the DMK, who are allies or work with the Congress. They are electoral allies or on governments with the Congress. The TMC is not. And this is where we want to make a distinction. So when the Congress party announces a vice president candidate, some parties who are all the parties who are allied with it will line up and support it. We have to make our point, And in this case, we made our point that, listen, you can't give us a 10 minute notice because uh, the the uh, sec the uh, what is he the secretary of the CPIM and and Congress will get together they'll announce a candidate and we'll all line up no so what did we say you can't give us ten minutes notice give us the name and then we're having a press conference in fifteen minutes please agree no treat us as equals we will we'll find opportunities. The BJP can be defeated in 2024, but the grand old party have to treat MPs, uh, parties like the Trinamool Congress, both inside parliament and outside parliament, as equal partners. Okay. That does not, and there's another party here which none of you do any television programs about. You're talking about the Congress, the TMC, the DMK. What about the f original ally of the BJP now, which nobody discusses? Mr. Naveen Patnaik and the Biju Janta Dal. They are the allies of the BJP. Allies of the BJP. So the opposition, we will, we will find ways to find common issues, agenda, where we will, f we will make this happen. Can so I, this was can a I vice quickly, president. No leave us, can I ask you the, one last time, before you leave us, Korn Banega challenger. Who will be the challenger? Isn't there one upmanship, yes or no, over who occupies the leadership space of the opposition? Quick answer. I can, I can speak for my party, the Trinamool Congress. The chairperson, Mamta Banji, wants to be the squirrel in the garden. We will do the dirty work. She's not interested who will become, she will become, not, not interested in being the prime minister. We'll be the squirrel in the garden. We will do all the dirty work in the garden. We will do all the dirty work to defeat the BJP. But here, here it is, don't take the Trinamool Congress for granted. This is the same Trinamool Congress okay. who fought a very difficult election in 2021. Let me leave it there. Mr. O'Brien joining us saying, don't take us for granted. Good point on which to turn to you, Yogendra Yadav. Is that part of the problem, listening to a Derek O'Brien, that there is this one-upmanship. There is no sense of common purpose beyond anti-Modism. The one thing that I gather in the opposition narrative is anti-Modism. Modi ko hatana hai. But within the opposition, there's this battle, Kejriwal, Mamta, the Congress for leading that opposition space. Nor is there a Jai Prakash Narayan-like figure to hold it all together. Uh, there is a clear problem, Rajdeep. Uh, there is a lack of uh, unity of purpose. 
uh, in opposition and that is clearly a setback that is a problem that the opposition has to sort out before 2024 uh, but i have been saying again and again and again there is no need for grand opposition alliance to take on the bjp thinking of challenges let's think of the country in terms of three geographies last year. let us stop looking for the one challenger to the bjp there is a geography of the country about 200 seats if you start traveling from west bengal down to kerala and a few more states a little less than 200 seats the bjp is not the dominant party in fact bjp is the challenger here in 2019 out of these 193 seats bjp managed to win 38 thanks to a very good performance in bengal this time they would be lucky if they pick up 25 in these so out of 193 bjp would get something around 25 30 in these uh, in this first geography the second geography are places where opposition unity is necessary maybe need these are places like karnataka maharashtra jharkhand bihar and so on these are about 150 seats bjp got 110 yes you need some opposition unity I suspect that would be somehow cobbled together. Opposition needs to restrict BJP below 100, ideally to 75. The real game, Rajdeep, is in the third geography, which is the Hindi heartland plus um, minus Bihar plus Gujarat. This is exactly 200 seats. Mm -hmm. In these 200 seats, BJP has been winning about 175, 180 seats in the last two elections. This is where the real challenge for the opposition is. The question is, in these places, uh, in Uttar Pradesh Samajwadi Party now, and in the rest of the seat, Congress is the principal challenger. Will we see these challengers challenging each other? Would we see Congress diminish from the existing status of a challenger? Do we see Congress getting up and taking on this battle seriously? This is what the real question is, but please remember, BJP would win, need to win more than 150 seats out of 200 to get majority in the Lok Sabha. Now, this which is a did. very high ask, which they have done in the last two elections. That's but right. please remember, if you were BJP, you would be worried. This is a very, very high ask for any political party of the world in any election. With inflation, with unemployment, with uh, your currency down and incidentally our economy did not start going down after covid our economy was already going down for several quarters before uh, the pandemic hit our country so and, and with this state of economy this is going to be a very very tough election for the bjp unless the opposition gives up the battle before it begins Remember, of course, even in 2019, the numbers were down and yet the BJP had this huge strike rate in North India. But it brings me to the key question. Is the Congress the weak link? Kumar Ketkar, you may have heard Derek O'Brien saying the Congress cannot take us for granted when you put a vice president candidate or a presidential candidate, particularly the vice presidential candidate. But importantly, taking off from what Yogendra Yadav said, in the key geography of the country, where elections are decided, it seems that where the battle is BJP versus Congress, we saw both in 2014 and 19, the BJP demolished the Congress. The BJP finds it much more difficult to take on the regional parties than the Congress. In about 190 seats of one and one battles, the Congress barely won a dozen. Do you therefore concede that the Congress is the Kamzor Kadi or the weak link in the opposition? And unless the Congress revives itself, it will remain advantage Bharatiya Janata Party leading up to 2024. I think you are presuming that last eight years experience, electoral experience, is all that we have. We have experience of elections even before that. And putting a question on challenger and again the number of Congress seats that they, they are losing, you think that in 1996, where was the challenger? Nobody knew Devagoda's name in most of the country, and Devagoda won. Devagoda won means Devagoda was chosen. At that time, the question was not who is the challenger. Similarly, in 1998 also, there was no question of who is the challenger. So, 1996 election or 1998 elections were fought without any challenger. And in 2004, 
nobody thought Sonia Gandhi was a challenger to Vajpayee. On the one hand, there was this towering leadership of Vajpayee, and on the other hand, a person who doesn't understand Hindi or India. And yet, Sonia Gandhi built a coalition which won. So I don't think this challenger business, and another point, responding to Yogendra Yadav, let us not forget that even in 1977, under the great leadership of Jayaprakash, South did not vote for Janta Party. Out of something like 130 seats, only six seats went to Janta Party, 124 or some such seats went to their respective parties. They did not go, majority of them went to Congress, they did not go to Janata Party. So to say that Jayaprakash magic, Jayaprakash unifying leadership, that helped, that did not help in South, that helped only in the North. So to compare only Northern victories, that is Northern and partly Western victories, Gujarat and UP and Himachal Pradesh and Rajasthan and Madhya, Madhya Pradesh, to say that they are invincible, I think is converting Indian politics only to northern Indian politics and secondly the state but the parties BJP, whether they but, unite but or still not, not answering they the central can question BJP, is the Congress they can no no but BJP, Mr. Ketkar Mr. Ketkar the Congress being BJP, the weak link they can defeat BJP in their respective parties Congress is not a Congress is not a calculating factor at all in Tamil Nadu but BJP did not win so in Congress need not necessarily be the weaving partner. Congress can lose, Congress can uh, defeat, Congress cannot be and need not be necessarily a com you know, kind of a component that unites everybody. Congress will do that. Congress will try to do that. But that election in 2024 Sir, Madhya is not Pradesh, dependent Rajasthan, only on Chattisgarh. Congress, Sonia, Rahul. Only not... You These know are... how Madhya Pradesh was won? You know how Madhya Pradesh was won and actually actually sabotaged. You know how Karnataka was won and how it was sabotaged. You know how Goa was won last time and how it was sabotaged. So all this, all these victories at Skaldagari, that does not define 2024. BJP will continue to play Skaldagari game. BJP will continue to play games. All the games of thrones they will play. But that does not mean that the voters are likely to be impressed by that. Voters are already disgusted. Many BJP members privately tell us how disgusted they are with the current rule. Because okay. they don't have any access, they don't have any role to play. Majority Pro of the BJP leadership. Professor Shastri? So discontent in the BJP also will be a factor which we are not counting at all. But no, but discontent in BJP will never reflect like uh, discontent in Congress. And that's why we feel it is a monolith. It is not a monolith anymore internally. Okay. You want to respond therefore, Nalin Kohli? That A, to what uh, Yogendra Yadav suggests, that the BJP has certain geographical limitations that exist. So you will again need, like 2019, a huge strike rate in North India. Let's not go, uh, 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 you know, that is one challenge that you face. And number two, according to Kumar Ketkar, internal discontent. That for all this talk of Mr. Modi being invincible, there are those within the party who feel that, there is, that the party is a one-man show increasingly. We did do exceedingly well in Uttar Pradesh in both the elections and in the Northern Belt. And then certainly in the South, we lack the depth across several states. Now, however, I'm going to go back to an anecdotal story which involved us, that is you and me in 2014 election. We were in Varanasi and I recall that you had specifically asked if I, if Amit Bhai, when he was heading the entire election there, after the election, in a group of journalists, what is the next plan? Ab kya amit bhai? And he had said, those are unnees ki tayari. And every, a lot of journalists laughed thinking, you know, you've just won the election, where's 2019? But that, I think, sums up the Modi Shah kind of an approach and the new BJP. It is that there is no resting on the laurels. It's a relentless work. And that's why when he said, as Prime Minister, my Pradhan Seva, 24 ghante ho. In the sense, it wasn't uh, lightly said. Now, in eight years down, that schedule of the Prime Minister remains the same and that kind of ruling schedule remains for all functionaries in the party and the government. Because this is seen as an opportunity, don't stop working. We have to keep working because there's so much to do. And that's why I use the argument of the beneficiaries right at the first part of your program. That there is a class of beneficiaries who have seen the benefits reach them. Now, certainly, there will be some who will say that politics will play out in the manner in which they are seeing it always. History is important. There are lessons to be learned there. 
But again, I'm going back to 2014, another anecdotal thing. When they would say, how do you see Prime Minister Modi? I mean, then prime ministerial candidate. The answer used to be, don't judge, because they approach it in a different way. And therefore, my argument would be that today, so far from both general elections and many, many important state elections, the vast majority, the opposition hasn't come up with a formula of leadership, ideology, agenda, or even a plan. So, so they need to have all of this before they can. That's why perhaps they are always hoping that the BJP will do badly. It's like saying the batsman will run himself out or you know hit wicket himself, and therefore we will win the match. It's not about bowling the batsman out. Okay, which brings me to the question. Is the Modi Reji, the new BJP under Mr. Modi, simply crushing the opposition? Is that the goal? We've seen it in Maharashtra, governments being toppled. We've seen other governments being changed, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, Goa. Raul Srivastava, is there a point in what Nalin Kohli is saying? A, don't only look at us uh, through the old prism of the BJP. This is a new BJP, social engineering, labharthis or the beneficiaries of welfare projects. You've seen the president being chosen, who's from the Adivasi community. They've reached out to Dalits in the past. They are creating a new social coalition, which is far more formidable electorally than what the BJP had in the past. Is that a sense that you get that this is a new BJP, which is being looked by the opposition through an old prism? Razib, it's a predatory party now. It's, it's a predatory party. Definitely. You see, it has... See, there is a difference, Razdeep, in the BJP of the past and the all the governments which have come in the past, every other political party in this country wanted to win elections, hook or crook, they all have done it, but they wanted to come to power, that's it. This party wants to win election but has other goal, it has got an ideology. And that is why the battle is different. And that is why Narendra Modi becomes a different leader. The issue here is that BJP is plotting a million uh, battles against various state players and everybody in different states. Whereas the state players are locked in their own state battles. So how do they plot for a national battle against the BJP? There is a crisis there. So you are it giving, for happen. example, in a Telangana where a KCR is today sort Congress, of being encircled by Naidu. the BJP. So I, the question is, when you say predatory, does that mean they are using institutions? Because the opposition will say, you know, we have no chance. The media is against us. The uh, the uh, enforcement directorate is being used to crush us. Do you go along with that, see, or do you believe see, it's Razdeep. the Labharthi social composition that needs to be looked at more closely see, Razdeep, when we discuss I, the BJP's power? I think governments have been predatory. Degrees vary. Narsema Rao, when he came to power, I know what happened. That so many congressmen left the party because he was using the agencies. There were charges. I think that's not the issue. The issue here is that this idea of like-minded, the problem what Mr. Ketkar was saying, that when was in against Vajpayee, what happened? The problem is Vajpayee made mistakes. Vajpayee government made mistakes. People voted against Vajpayee. Uh, people were unhappy with the other governments. Devagora came in. People may give a fragmented uh, verdict, but the point here is that today people are perhaps looking for a more cohesive competence. It is looking for like-minded people even before the election, not after the election that you say that we are like-minded, we want to come to power. I think that's where the BJP is doing better. Also, you think the, the BJP offers a better narrative than the uh, than the opposition time. offers, it's a, a better very, leadership than the opposition it's offers. It's a at cohesive the na political narrative. It's aligned to, I think, what the public is thinking today. It's keyed into the mainstream. It's ready to make amends, changing political demographic basis from a Brahman Banya party to an OBC Dalit tribal party. And the policy, Rajdeep, the delivery mechanism, Rajdeep. targeting, I think it's a very focused machinery, though predatory, but definitely much more focused. Sandeep Shastri, do you agree with that, that we have seen the most formidable election machine in the history of post-independence India, which is in a way captured the system. We can see that in negative terms. We can also see it as perhaps an example of power is politics. Rahul Gandhi says power is poison. The BJP will say power is politics. Uh, Rajdeep, while agreeing with that sentiment, I would go back to the question you phrased. I think the moment you say Khan Banega challenger, the opposition has lost the battle. Because that is what the BJP would like the narrative to be. 
that who is the challenger to the prime minister mm -hmm. alternatively it should be a fight on issues a fight on policies a fight on alternatives and not a positing of who is the alternative leader now if the opposition were to focus and on kon banega challenger i think the battle has been lost even before it has begun mm -hmm. it has to be a fight on issues it has to be a fight on alternatives and as yogenji said 28 states represent 28 different electoral battles this time the real fight as i see it would be in west india east india and the south of india and how the bjp does in these three regions will be critical how do the non bjp parties in these regions do will be critical and that i think will decide the way the 2024 election will go interesting uh, the way you are putting it that the battle in a sense will be fought state wise i know even before 2019 i heard this we will fight 543 separate elections against the bjp that didn't happen there was a virtual wave a modi wave a post balakot wave whichever way you see it but yogendra yadav therefore what can change between now and 2024 i remember in december 2018 when the congress did well in rajasthan madhya pradesh chatisgarh there was a sense the bjp was vulnerable five months later the bjp swept all these states as well so what can change between now and 2024 to in a way change my original question is it a done deal for mr modi that he will have a hat trick uh, rajdeep a lot is already changing the question is about converting them in that into electoral uh, electoral gains for the opposition uh, mr modi's government is increasingly seen to be ankari uh, very arrogant that never goes down well with the indian the economy is in a very very bad shape Yes, the beneficiaries remember the LPG cylinder that they got. Yes, the beneficiaries remember the five kg ration that they got, but they also remember the jobs they lost. They also remember the person who died in their family without oxygen. The real situation is that we are looking at an economy, an everyday condition of the people, which is very, very bad. The real question is, can the opposition translate that? No, you said. Politics. no but you said that yogendra ji with due regard to some extent even before uttar pradesh and look what happened so clearly someone is missing something that is happening on the ground that while we say that the economy is struggling while we say look what happened how was covid management particularly the second wave the bjp either is able to cause correct effectively or has built a certain emotional connect that mr modi as leader in particular has done that transcends conventional political logic rasti there is no difference between what we are saying i completely agree the situation is bad but th things being bad automatically does not translate into electoral uh, defeat for the ruling party and i actually agree with mr nalin kohli that if the opposition is waiting for mr modi and the bjp to uh, you know go get run out or hit wicket they could wait another 20 years that's not going to happen. the opposition has to do something and to my mind and i have a slightly different reading or probably a different emphasis from professor shastri i think the name of the game is can bjp be checked even partially in this north west indian heartland in the heartland with up plus gujarat minus bihar that to my mind is the real challenge out of these 200 seats or so can bjp restricted to be restricted to 125 and for that the revival of the congress congress being able to take on the bjp is absolutely vital that would require I, the opposition the congress in particular to appear to be more credible than it appears in the eyes of the people today this to my mind is the most critical piece of 2024 i tend to agree with you and kumar ketkar therefore you need to answer that the congress is credibility it brings us to the elephant in the room rahul gandhi the gandhi family you know the congress seems to be status quo is everything else is changing the regional parties are gearing up to fight mr modi they are ready to fight the congress at the moment is fighting within it's unable to provide a leadership that is seen as credible that is seem to seem to connect with new india 
Do you concede that, that somewhere you're going to have to resolve your problem? You're this big pan-Indian brand, but you lack effective, credible leadership at the moment. You're practicing politics the old way. Sonia Gandhi uh, 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 gets questioned before the enforcement directed you hit the streets. But on real issues connecting to the public, you're nowhere to be seen. Is the argument being made against you? Or that you're not effective enough to put those uh, uh, points before the public? I think false shortcomings and weaknesses of the Congress are publicly known and publicly discussed. But you cannot choose history selectively. In 2015, when Modi was at his supreme best, he lost Delhi just one year after 2014. 67 seats out of 70. Aap won. Aap was a completely yes, Aap, new not player Congress. Mr. No Ketkari was no Aap Aadmi Party because Similarly, Arvind Kejriwal came out Aap, as a credible leader. I am leader. not talking about... I am... Why are you... Why are you... Why are you... Why are you emphasizing only Congress? I am talking about defeating Modi. And you are mm. talking about Congress emerging. Why are you talking only Congress emerging? Congress will emerge. Congress can emerge and Congress will emerge. That is not the question. Question is defeating Modi. And Modi has been defeated in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, even in Delhi. And therefore, to say, and in that situation of complete manthan, then the Congress can emerge. Don't forget that Modi at his peak in 2014 got only 31% vote and with NDA in 2019, what he got is, only 37%. What is vote. the role of Congress the Gandhi family in this, sir? Low number of sir, seats. What is with the role low number of, the... of seats, Congress, Congress, why are you constantly obsessed with Sonia and Rahul? When Congress won lowest vote, that was 41%, Congress won 282 seats. So I don't think, you know, 69% of the people have voted against Modi in 2014 and 63% people have voted. Now how to bring those 63% or 69% people together? Under one banner, that is not possible. Things have changed completely in last. And the Hindu-Muslim question, which Congress could not understand because Congress can never divide or polarize society like Modi does. So Hindu-Muslim question did create a frenzy across the country. And that frenzied vote, you are taking as a major reference statistical point. Frenzied okay. vote should never be considered as a statistical reference for victories and defeats. You agree with that, Professor Shastri, Hindu that there is a frenzied frenzy Hindutva is vote? What is okay, there is a frenzied Hindutva vote. We saw it in 2014 to some extent, along with this vote for change then, this Ache Din vote, which was anti incumbency. In 2019, we saw it post Balakot. Is there that frenzied Hindu vote, which is very difficult to dismantle at the moment? Just, it's not the enough to blame the Congress leadership. Okay, it's not just enough to blame the Congress leadership. You're facing a force that is appealing to... Underlying vote was Hindu vote. Okay. You want to respond, Professor Shastri, to that? Uh, it was a Hindu uh, vote. No, there is no question of doubt that there has been a strong attempt at majority consolidation, but there are limits to that happening. I think the more important point which I would like to re-stress, which I made, and while agreeing with Professor Yadav, I would like to look at where the BJP faces a critical contest or where the BJP faces a likely strong opponent. And it's in that context I was talking of West India, South India and East India. I would believe even as the present situation stands that the BJP's competitors in North India, if you look at that, the BJP still seems to be in a stronger position. The potential for that challenge in West, East and South India is much, much stronger. And that's why the, I emphasize the need right. to look at these regions when we look at 2024 coming up. Remember, of course, in 2014 in particular, more than 80% of the BJP seats came from North and Western India, but it has slowly expanded. I just want to ask you, therefore, Nalin Kohli, we are running out of time. Is the BJP invincible in your view? I know this is a, a, a question that uh, perhaps uh, I could have a predictable answer, but is the BJP invincible? If you were to uh, be a strategist for your opponents, is there a weak point? What is your weakest point? What is it that worries you, Nalin Kohli? Is there a weak point? Honestly, the second part, though, I can't answer. Because whatever we've been doing has been going well in terms of electoral victories, broadly speaking, of course, we don't win all elections and nobody can win all elections in a democracy. 
But certainly we are winning again and again under Prime Minister Modi and the BJP. But is there a concern? Is there is there something that concerns you? What can change between now and 2024? Look, I would hope that there is no change, not because of a party perspective, and I'll be candid about it, Rajdi, is that in a world where violence is increasing and on a daily basis we see threats and all, I just pray that India doesn't see any of that kind of situation that we've seen in the past. So therefore, uh, with me, what I'll only hope is that an external factor does not try to destabilize things which is an event, which is, you know, not directly homegrown in that sense. Right. I look at always terrorism as a risk factor to every election in the country. So therefore, barring that, I think broadly there's nothing I could say that the BJP is not getting right. Is there that black swan event that you see? There could be a black swan event, as we've seen, that can change elections. But Rahul Srivastav, I know that we can never say any party is invincible, but you track the BJP. Do you get a sense from talking to BJP leaders Internally, do they believe that Mr. Modi is poised for a hat trick? Do they? Is there anything they fear that can change between now and 2024? See, Rajiv, I think no political party or a cadre or leadership ever works that it thinks that it is there. I think the entire cadre moves in a direction it, when it thinks that its leadership is doing things to move there. Is there anything they fear? They, is there anything they are worried see, about? And and in that, if you see. Changing the base, getting a tribal woman as a president is a foray into a vote which the BJP perhaps was getting weak. Uh, Telangana, they are, they are, they have a plan. Now, opposition too. Yes, Mamta Banerjee has a plan. She's giving those signals that I have national aspirations. Kejriwal, for example. For example, a Do they fear a Kejriwal? See, yes, I'm 100%. It's not the fear factor. They... Uh, they compute the factor, they factor in that there is a Kejriwal. So today, if there is going to be a Gujarat battle in which Kejriwal is mounting, mounting a slight battle against Modi, then they will prop the Congress a bit. There might be ED strikes. All kind of things happen in Indian politics, Rajdeep. What I will say that to defeat BJP at this moment, it is always said that the strength of the system is the weakness of the system. Narendra Modi is a strong leader that the BJP has. If my heart is a strong part of my body, it keeps me alive. The day it fails, makes a mistake, I'm gone. Similarly, I think it is Narendra Modi who's pulling this engine. And if he makes a mistake, I think that's one thing the BJP has to watch out for. Okay, let's leave it at that point. It's been fascinating to hear articulate voices, no crosstalk. 20 months to go for the 2024 elections. As I keep reiterating, a week is a long time in Indian politics. Who knows what tomorrow brings? Kal kisne dekha hai. But for now, it appears the BJP juggernaut is rolling on. Can the opposition get its act together is going to be the big challenge. We want a competitive fight to enhance democracy. Thank you all very much for joining me on this special round table. To all our viewers, thanks for watching. Bye for now. I don't read the news. I read between the lines to tell you the true version of events. The true story of our times. To document grief, the toughest assignment for any journalist to be from those who matter. Women politicians gonna stick up for each other. Of those who should matter. I document the truth. I don't distort the truth. I don't glamorize the truth. I don't gloss over the truth. The ghosts of India's contentious medieval history have come knocking again. I hustle for the truth. On the ground, in the newsroom, in the I studio. I don't try to grab eyeballs. I inform you to make you see the point. To the point with Preeti Chaudhary at these times only on India Today. After the Philippines, now Indonesia wants this missile from India. It is in high demand across the world. This is the Indo-Russian BrahMos missile. 
As per reports, India is in the advanced stages of signing an export deal for the Brahmos missile with Indonesia. Indonesia is expected to buy the ship-borne variant of the cruise missile for its warships. In January this year, the Philippines had signed a $375 million contract for the shore-based variant of the Indo-Russian Brahmos anti-ship missile. Apart from the Philippines and Indonesia, Vietnam is also interested in acquiring the Brahmos. India is also known to be in talks with Argentina, Brazil and South Africa for the sale of Brahmos as New Delhi seeks to increase its defence exports as part of the government's Make in India and Atmanirbhar Bharat initiatives. We don't do our hands and we don't do तो ये संभव नहीं होने वाला है शुरुआत हमें अपने से करनी होती है और ब्रह्मोस इसका उदाहरण है जब भारत ने ब्रह्मोस को गले लगाया दुनिया ब्रह्मोस को गले लगाने के लिए आज कतार में खड़ी हो गई है दोस्त हमें अपने हर निर्मित चीजों के प्रति हमें गर्व होना चाहिए द ब्रह्मोस Department released a statement saying that they will make Bangalore street dog free. I speak as the voice of each street dog and community dog in the city because they have rights too. The only solution, as you all know, is ethical animal birth control. Activists and rescuers like us spend our own money, you know, take hundreds and hundreds of streeties we feed to private vets and get them sterilized. Where are the ABC funds gone? So as per Section 11 of the Prevention of Cruelty Animals Act 1960, it is illegal to relocate or cause any kind of harm to street and community animals. Because crores of money has been sanctioned for ABC program in the city for ages now. Ever since ABC program has started in the city, crores of money has been sanctioned. The question is, where has that money gone?
Why is that every year around the time of monsoons, life comes to a complete standstill in Assam? What makes flooding so deadly in Assam? Is it poor planning, climate change or is it a culmination of both? More than 174 lives were lost due to current wave of floods in Assam. Continuous rains, landslides and floods have only intensified the loss of lives and property. Experts have pointed out some of the possible reasons here, like faulty flood control measures, shrinking water bodies, population increase and of course unregulated construction. The flood in the two river basins of Barak and Brahmaputra is not new but the intense destruction can be because of these reasons. Moreover, frequent flash floods also add to their woes which leave people very little time to protect themselves and their property. In many instances, early warnings and flood forecasts don't reach vulnerable population. So there is no scope for preparation at all. Heavy rainfall and large rivers are the characteristic of the Indian subcontinent spanning from Bangladesh to the northeastern states of India. The Brahmaputra Basin is among the most flood-prone areas in the world. Both Brahmaputra and Barak make 40% of Assam quite vulnerable. The Brahmaputra region gets around 1,000 to 6,000 millimetres of rainfall during monsoons. Adding to it are glaciers which start to melt during summer, increasing the volume of water. With the tremendous flow of water, erosion of river banks multiplies, ten folds and compounds the flood. Some studies show that Brahmaputra erodes more than they deposit. This destabilizes and loosens the soil around it. Urban flooding in areas such as Gowahato, Silchar, Tinshukia occurs because of a faulty drainage system of the state. From drainage congestion to choking of local water bodies, urban flooding has intensified. It is because earlier the local water bodies and better draining system would flush out the water. Other reasons like deforestation, climate change also compound flooding problems. Experts say increasing air and surface temperatures have a role to play in the unprecedented floods. It feeds more water from the melting glaciers of the Himalayas. Moreover, studies show that monsoon in India has been affected by the rising global temperature. सुन लो मित्रों लिख लो है काम की मित्रों मेरे इंडिया की गलियों में फेंको मत सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक करती ये कहती है मदर नेचर प्लास्टिक क्यों रहती है वाइ टू स्पॉइल इट आई कीप सेइंग ऑल डे ऑल डे ऑल लाइक लॉन्ग सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक बैन पॉली बैन पॉली बैन सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक बैन कर से थैला लाओ मैन हो सबसे बोली से नो टू नो टू पॉली नेचर की बेबसी है दैट्स व्हाई ये पॉलिसी है प्लास्टिक को ना है कहना भारत को स्वच्छ है बनाना सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक वाले ग्लास चम्मच कांटे सब बैन अब जाके मिलेगा जरा नेचर को चैन सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक बैन पॉली बैन पॉली बैन सिंगल यूज प्लास्टिक बैन घर से थैला लाओ मैन हो Presented by Green Lamb Laminates, Har Gusta Ki Saaf. Co-powered by, if it's important, Blue Dot It. In association with, Hetic Fittings, make your furniture work beautifully. Offer pe offer, sirf kalyan jolas mein.